share screen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, three, two, one. We're live. Thank you all so much for joining us. Very, very exciting, exciting day uh, for everyone here at Powtoon, for everyone who's joining us, revisualizing learning in 2022, how to upgrade learning content for measurable results with Powtoon and the Learning Cluster Design Group. This is going to be a really wonderful session today. We had tons of people register. Please give us a shout out in that chat box. Let us know what's your name, where are you joining us from? And what are your learning goals for 2022? Do you have a big, hairy, audacious goal you're going after this year? Uh, are you just drawing up your plans? Are you starting to implement a big plan you've already hatched up for the year? Let us know in that chat box right there. Hello from London, says Vincenzo. Vin Vincenzo. Hello, Vincenzo. Welcome. We've got Caleb joining us from Dallas, Texas. Oh, man, they're all coming in. Elizabeth, who's joining us from uh, Riverside, California. Welcome. Tomas from Warsaw. Hello, Tomas. Uh, good afternoon. I should say hello from Chicago, Lori Schellenberger. Hello. And also Justine. Hello from Chicago, my hometown. Very, very glad to have you all with us today. Tons of folks coming in. Please send those along. Uh, Ramani from India says, I want to improve my performance as a teacher, as an instructor. Awesome. Yes. Wonderful. Good morning from south of Chicago, says Laura. Uh, hello. Greetings from the Philippines. Jerome, thank you. Oh, we've got folks from all over the world uh, with us today. Very, very excited to have that. Let's move on to introductions. My name is Nick, head of head creator for uh, video and learning here at Powtoon. And, I, and our guest today is Crystal Kadakia, co-creator of the Learning Cluster Design Model and CEO of the LCD Group. Please say hello, Crystal. Welcome. Hey, everybody. It's so good to see so many people joining. I see some familiar names from our dialogue. Glad to have you here from the LCD community. And also so great to meet all of you in the Powtoon community. It's just so exciting to be here today with you all this morning and this afternoon and this evening, wherever you may be. Wherever you may be and maybe possibly in the future if you're watching this uh, on demand. So very, very glad you're all joining us and no matter what time you are. Before we dive in, I just wanna give everyone a sense of what we're in for today. Uh, our conversation is gonna cover a powerful new model for learning. Crystal's gonna tell us all about that. Why video? is so important. What's that role of video in your 2022 plan? A little bit about this, the context here. How are corporate L&Ds pivoting from traditional ways of learning? What are they replacing it with? Plus, you get to join our conversation in the Q&A section. Actually, throughout our conversation, right in that Q&A box, if you see on your uh, control there, you should see Q&A. You can enter in a question. If you see a question, that you wanted to ask, you can give it an upvote. Uh, so that'll help us kind of prioritize when we get to the question and answer section. So whatever comes to mind, if you've got a specific challenge you're trying to resolve related to your uh, instructional design or your learning plans for 2022, if you've got a question that comes up along the way, there are no bad questions. There's only good questions. So yeah, don't hold back. <laughs> don't hold back. So basically, let's talk. Crystal, if you're ready, let's dive in. Uh, before we begin with the first question, actually, I did, and if it's not too embarrassing, I did want to just read a little bit from your bio, because it's really, it, it actually, I, I, I was reading this, and I was like, oh, man, she's so awesome, and I can't wait to hear her perspective on learning and what this means. But just very, very briefly, I'll run through this. Uh, Crystal Kadakia, CEO, co-creator of the LCD model. As the co-creator of, of the LCD model, Crystal initiated the broader effort to launch the LCD group and make the LCD model and learning clusters a norm for learning design. In addition, she also leads her own independent organizational development consulting practice, where she brings the full capabilities of her multifaceted background to serve clients and her team. She's a sincere thought leader with accolades such as being a two-time TEDx speaker, a Power 30 Under 30 award winner, an international keynoter, author of The Millennial Myth, Transforming Misunderstanding into Workplace Breakthroughs, and co-author of Your Career, How to Make It Happen with Lisa M.B. Owens. I just also just to put to tie it all together, this is such a great 
uh, paragraph here. Crystal's passion ultimately is to help people and organizations see and make the most of possibilities to make a positive difference in their communities. She's She constantly creates models to help make sense of complexity, right? We all are grappling with an ever more complex world. Help us make consensus of, a sense of complexity and seeks to apply those models in different fields for different problems. Her current project is a deep study of self-leadership actions that help create connection, escape burnout, and overcome the challenges unique to our digital age. I mean, I, I couldn't think of a, a, a better setup to talk about learning in 2022. And I think we should just start, give us a little context. What is learning cluster design? What's a learning cluster? What does this mean? And what can it help an organization accomplish? Yeah, so that last part of that bio, the part about how are we navigating the digital age, things like burnout, things like connection. Here's the, the reality is that we have a ton of advanced technology around us. You know, Palteen is a great example of that. And as usual, and completely understandable, it's our thinking and our ways of working, our people, you know, our brains that are lagging behind. And this goes true with learning too, and how we design learning. Um, when you think about how we design learning, we have all these technologies out there, but our methods for designing learning were Back in the 1950s, 1960s, they've evolved slowly but surely, but really haven't quite made the leap into the digital age. And, you know, you might say, well, who are you to say that? How do you know that? Well, just picture anybody learning anything. Um, going to a class, taking an e-learning, it's usually their last resort, right? That's the last thing they're doing. Um, what do people actually do? They're maybe they're reading a quick resource. Maybe they're definitely watching videos, right? That's probably the first thing I do is I pull up YouTube. I pull up internal YouTubes and I watch a video. They talk to someone and they try it out. Those are all the kinds of things we're doing. And yet what we're all, whenever, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, if you're in L&D or if you're in customer education, if you are um, just a coach or doing internet marketing, and you're thinking about, well, how do I want to teach people something? The, our first go-to is, let me design a class around that. Let me design a course around that. And we don't learn that way. We, that might be a part of it, but that's not everything. So what's learning cluster design? It is a model that calls for a new learning product. Rather than designing a single course class or program when you have a problem, we're all about designing a cluster. Um, a set of learning assets that surrounds the learner when, where, and how they most want and need to learn. And our method, Learning Cluster Design Model, it actually has five actions that walks you through how to create that set of learning assets. Um, so this is just so powerful because it's, it seems like a very obvious thing because obviously we all use multiple things when we're learning, but when it comes to designing that set, not so obvious, not so easy. And so that's what we're all about. Um, Lisa and I, Lisa M.D. Owens and I, we co-authored the book, Designing for Modern Learning. We started working on this model, developing it back in 2015, and um, since then have just grown and grown and seen the need for this. And as you mentioned in the bio, back in 2020, really uh, right before the pandemic started, I was like, you know, let's not let this just be a book on the shelf. Let's really try to spread this and really become the the way, the thinking, the thinking part of the way that the learning industry starts to move away from one and done. Um, because like moving away from one and done, I mean, that's already done in my view, but a lot of us are still, that's what we're delivering because we don't have a different way to leverage our technology tools. We don't have a different design model. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really what we're about. Um, Technology is really, you know, it's creating that asynchronous access to learning assets, but it doesn't mean we know as designers how to push that technology, you know, use it all the way and do it in a way that really impacts on the job performance or, you know, that end goal we're trying to get to, you know, really create change. And so that's really what we're all about um, with the learning cluster design model. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's intuitive. And I and I hear this from Powtoon users uh, across uh, uh, industries, right, and across roles, but definitely in the L&D space that people simply don't learn well in this click next kind of, I've, I've made a presentation, you see the thing, you click next, you take a quiz at the end, okay, we're done, you've learned that. It's not how we act in our own lives when we're looking to learn something and and it's and it's like out of context and i think that what you, what this is a really uh, an amazing way to put a, a a language and a methodology around these ideas so it's really really interesting i want to i want to continue on our our uh, quest here and talk about so you've already mentioned kind of the technological changes the history of of how you developed the learning cluster design model and are implementing it and working with companies to do it. But give us a broader kind of look at l and in, in an organization, in a company, right? Uh, how are they pivoting? What are the actions that they're taking? And what can an organization start doing to get up to speed with these changes? Yeah, I, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this in the last couple of years. Um, you know, what we hear a lot from our L&D folks internally is that, you know, they're getting more investment than ever in their organization, um, which I think, you know, is fabulous. Like, there is no better time to be in L&D. Um, before the pandemic, we for years have started been moving towards a very talent driven profit model where it's, you know, we're really wanting to upskill talent in much more complex skills than before. And what does that require? L&D, right? That requires a lot of learning. Um, and we're getting that investment. We're investing in a lot of tools. We're trying, and I'm watching this happen. And again, we don't necessarily know how to use those to the, the biggest advantage for us. And so the pandemic then came along. And I think, it, you know, a second big thing I'm seeing in L&D is that Besides the investment, of course, we got pushed. A lot of people who are even on the edge of, you know, hey, I'm really not sure if I want to do video or I want to do e-learning or I want to do virtual anything. The pandemic just forced that issue, right? And so, of course, you know, I think everyone has been experiencing this of, hey, we need to take everything we had live and do it in some way virtually. And now we're really moving from that to what's our new normal of, you know, what's our new blend? which of course learning clusters is all about the blend. It's all about, let's not just have the one way, let's do more than that. The challenge with virtual, and this is where I see a lot of L&D leaders starting to really struggle and, and really ask themselves this is, hey, does virtual automatically mean more e-learning or are there other things we can do? You know, What can we do better with video, with um, you know, how are we using our Zoom calls? How are we using our social learning platforms? Um, how does uh, how does social mean not just likes and discussions, but even users starting to participate in, you know, generating learning and people le truly learning from one another? Because, you know, as I mentioned, that's another way we often learn is we ask our neighbor, we ask someone. So how can we in corporations start leveraging that hive mind? to um, drive learning. And so I think that's been a really big, a big piece is there's folks who kind of have been in this assumption mode for a long time that virtual means one thing. And that one thing is let's try to duplicate our classes and courses, but duplicate it online. <laughs> and now it's like, whoa, wait a second. There's this whole other world of virtual and learning that's just it, it really pushes things, things differently. And that's kind of what I see with a lot of, um, you know, a lot of folks who are making that pivot and like, what are they starting to do? Uh, language is so important around this. I'm really glad you mentioned that because, you know, that's the kind of thing when what we're doing with LCD group last year, for example, you know, we worked with Atlassian and with Atlassian, it's like, let's get our whole team on this same page. And so, you know, we upscale them in the model and then they started using the model on their projects. And then we were like, well, they, they had these complex challenges, like things like ways of working, things like onboarding. And now they're like, hey, let's start working together so that way we can work on those complex initiatives and deliver learning clusters instead of this one and done approach. 
And, you know, every organization is like this. We're all getting more without borders, whether that's geographic, like country borders, but now it's really even more like local, urban, right? There's so many moves from cities to um, all over the country. And that's, to me, this is all fabulous because you're now able to recruit from a much wider net than before. And you, you get this whole new possibility to reinvent how you're doing learning in your organization. I mean, I just think, how cool is that? And you're getting people asking you, hey, can you please reinvent learning? Can you please reinvent it? And whenever I run into people who are like, no, I just want to do what I've always been doing. I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. How's that working for you? How's that working for you? Because, I mean, if it's working, great. You know, like, let's, you know, I'll stay in touch and I want to hear how it's working for you so I can help other people learn from you. But, hey, if you take a hard look and you're like, hmm, People are asking me for something new. What am I going to give them? That's when you got to say, what's going to help me move from one and done? Tools that help you create things quickly, efficiently. Tools that help you be creative. And then ways of thinking that help you use those tools, right? That all just makes sense. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And this is, you know, one one component of that, right? And this is something I've heard from other, uh, from people using Powtoon, from other organizations, other, other thought leaders I'm out there talking to. Uh, you know, really leveraging that expertise across your organization. It's not just the L and D team is sitting and creating these courses, uh, but but there's this collaborative thing. Actually, Dino in the chat here, uh, one of his challenges this year uh, to overcome subject matter expert resistance who want mm-hmm. to DIY because it's easier for them to put it together uh, and they don't want to change. They don't want to change how they're. Do- Listen, I've got my presentation. Here you go. You've got my information. Uh, you know, what's what's something, and this is a little off our original topic, but what, what's something people can do to inspire their colleagues to try it in a different way? Maybe it's even liberating a little bit to say, you know what, actually, you don't need to create an entire presentation or an entire course structure for this. It could be as simple as a two-minute face-to-camera uh, personal greeting and say, this is, this is a tip, trick that I use or that we use across our team or something like that. Tell me a little bit more. How can people overcome resistance to change in their organization? Yeah, I think that there's a, there were some immediate thoughts that came to mind for me. One was just one of the things I, I like to think about when someone doesn't want to do something um, or they're not ready to change something, I'll ask them, what is it that you least like doing right now? Like, what can we, what can we improve in that little bit that you don't like doing already, right? And maybe there's a possibility you could actually um, make that a better experience for you. Um, so, you know, for example, if it's like, oh man, every time I need to create videos, it's always been this full video production experience, right? I would say, hey, have you heard of Paltian? Like you could create this in minutes. Did you know that? <laughs> you know, let's let's try that out, right? That's one one way you can do it is really asking about what do you not do or what do you not like doing? Um, even when it comes to sharing resources. So with the SMEs, a lot of times what you said, like the do it yourself, like I just want to do this. I'm going to get it all done. It's like, well, what part of that task do you not like doing? Maybe we can bring in someone else from the organization or crowdsource that part of it. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways to get around the, uh, I don't want to change from that perspective. And then I think in terms of just being willing to experiment with not creating the class or the course and doing smaller bite-sized pieces, one of the things I found most helpful with that is uh, people are really focused on cramming everything they know into that class or course. And if you ever have someone sit through a PowerPoint they've created you know, like those 400 side PowerPoints, that's like, it's an eight hour long thing. And it's like talking, 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 talking. And you have them on the receiving end of that. Or you even just mention, hey, what's most important to you that you cram everything you know into that one class or course or that people actually attend? Like if you're gonna put all of that work into creating it, wouldn't you want someone to attend or watch it or, you know, whatnot? And have you thought about what might make that happen? (laughs) Because it's often not the 400 slides, eight hours straight, or even sometimes I'm seeing like the four hour long webinars that are straight, you know, classes that are straight lecture. And it's like, 
hmm, have you tried like watching that? And sometimes having SMEs coach other SMEs or coach other facilitators. Wow. Like experience is the best teacher. <laughs> what, a, what an insight. I mean, you know, as Vincenzo in the chat says involve and evolve. And I think that's exactly what that is asking yes. them themselves. What do you hate? What can we eliminate here? You know, uh, is a great place to start and really tapping into it. Cause they know, they know, right. They are the experts in their, what they're doing and they understand what's the most important information to get across the things that they count on again and again, that have helped them grow as professionals. Uh, and other parts of this may or may not be essential. In fact, let's ask them what's getting in the way of this. What is, uh, you know, what, what's something you would rather do, <laughs> you know, and exactly. And, and definitely the first part of it is getting out everything, you know, about a topic down, but it's like that to me, that's just the very first step of designing anything is you, you do your brain dump, right. Mm -hmm. But you don't present your brain dump to the end user. Right. That's not going to be that helpful. So and let's true. like move beyond that. I love it. Very cool. So my next question, and we've kind of hinted at it in a, in a few different ways here, but what's the role of video in learning today, right? Uh, how have you seen the industry use video to upgrade their learning? Again, you hinted at this a little bit, but spell it out. What's the role video is playing different kinds of videos? Uh, where are they falling in the cluster, if you will? Yeah, so I think of video as a very versatile tool to use it um, because not only can you use it in your normal formal programming. So if you're doing a class or a course, which by the way, I'm not saying classes and courses are going away. I think classes are essential. I just don't think they're the default. But you know, in your classes and courses, you can have videos as a part of that. But the other and obvious thing that we've been seeing with video is that it's a great immediate resource. So we tend to divide up um, learning assets, as we call them, into three different categories, formal, social, and immediate. And so immediate are those resources you can access 24 seven on your own with no help. Um, socials are the ones that where you're learning through others. And formal are those start, stop, class course sequence kinds of things. So you can really use video in all three of those, even that social component. What's so cool about videos, besides having like that listing of like a video library, with your videos, you can actually have your users contribute videos. You can have them video chat with one another as a part of a learning experience, right? Even if you think about a coaching call um, that uses video. Um, I use services where I'm, you know, doing very quick videos just to review documents or um, provide my coaching that way. And then someone will reply back. So there's just so many different ways that you can use video for learning because it, it, it's really, um, I think what's cool about it is video at the end of the day, it's, it's what's the anchor behind that? The anchor behind that is you have two, you have people right, on camera, and you have them at the, like, kind of like your face-to-face -face conversation or your conversation with yourself, but now it's just recorded. And so think of all of the ways you can use a conversation with another person face-to-face -face or a conversation with yourself. It's, it's like endless, right? You have your own reflections, your own voice, your own experiences. And then when you have that face-to-face -face conversation with someone else, you're now talking about those aha moments that happen where you really click with someone. And so I think video is one of our most powerful tools. And I'll say one other thing about it. For me, the bite-sizedness of it is not as, as necessary. So it's, again, it's like one way you can do it. Um, but I, I think that's been a rule in the learning industry. Like everything needs to be less than three minutes. Otherwise, you know, we're goldfish and we can't pay attention and et cetera, et cetera. But then at the same time, we have documentaries, right? And I've watched people binge watch Netflix for eight hours. So I know- And podcasts. I mean, this is a point that comes up all the time is right. that you know people, people are willing to sit and watch a video podcast for two and three hours, which is just a conversation, you know, or whatever uh, yeah. that podcast is. They have the patience when it's in the right context and when it's, you know, fits in with, with how they're working or what they're doing, you know? And the exactly. other- one other thing I wanted to mention, this is something we're seeing also, and you, you made reference to it earlier, is that sort of uh, there once was a video production needed a level of production. And I think especially over the last two years, because, because of 
the pandemic, because of the increased remote work, also because of technology. Everybody is walking around with a cell phone that is basically a video production studio in their pocket. Um, people, uh, the barrier to what makes a good video is no longer just expensive production. And people aren't as, uh, or maybe are more willing to put themselves into a video to feel authentic. Uh, and they, they don't need to worry as much about those high level production values, which of course, increase costs, increase time, make the entire project much more, much more complicated and make it difficult to, to create video for these little moments and for these um, supplementary ways of sharing, learning with each other. Yeah, I mean, that is such an excellent point because I think a lot of times we get distracted by the facade over the, the real intent or like the real anchor behind what it is you're trying to get across. Um, it's like, if you remember at the start of the pandemic, people would come like makeup and like completely nothing in their backgrounds before they would use their webcam on, on Zoom or whatever. And then like slowly, steadily over time, it got into like pajamas and like, whatever, dude, like I'm just, I rolled out of bed. That's cool. I'm here. I'm present. Right. It's kind of like that same transition. It's like we went from this huge giant video production studio that, you know, you have to have on site invested in and everyone's got to be like you know, to the nines. And then it's like, but wait, like I'm seeing people online just create great videos off my phone. Why can't we do that in corporate? What's, what are we really afraid of with like removing the facade a little bit and getting more real? And I think the more people have gotten real, the more we realize we're not that afraid of it because if anything, it creates this greater connection this greater impact, this greater effectiveness, all with less time because we're not spending our time on the facade. We're spending it on what matters, which is whatever it is we're trying to communicate as people where we're trying to help each other learn and change and grow together as you know a team. And I think that's that's been a huge, I think it's a great point you're bringing up because it's been a huge evolution for our industry. Definitely. Definitely. I just want to remind everyone who's on the call today, if you have a question, I'm seeing some questions come in in the chat, actually click the Q&A uh, button right next to the chat and put your questions in the Q&A section. That way we can get to them as we round out our conversation today. Uh, quick question. So what have you seen happen with LCD alumni, especially the ones who are adopting tools like Powtoon that help them increase their ability to create video content. In other words, what's the outcome? What are the results people are achieving? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, every single learning department I talk to is at capacity. You know, I was mentioning this, they're getting like more investment than before, but they're maxed out. Um, you know, they're handling 150 training topics and they're just trying to figure out how to do these live virtual deliveries for those topics. And that's one of the biggest outcomes I think today's tools, tools like Powtoon really help people with because it shortcuts that timeline. Uh, again, ultimately when it's paired with a, a design process that works for them, like LCD model, it, you really get this home run success with your users and your stakeholders because you, you have now a way to shortcut those topics, again, from being, let's cram everything I know into this one thing to what are the pieces people need to know and how can I bring those pieces out there in a creative, authentic way? And I think that those are the kinds of outcomes Powtoon is helping with. Um, another big concept we have in the learning cluster model is about learner personas. Uh, I think the whole idea of a single target audience, I think it's just, it's kind of a myth today. Um, you know, if you go back to that example of saying of just imagining people learning today or imagining yourself learning today, you might quickly start to realize, you know, everyone chooses something different in terms of how they learn or what content they want to focus on. And, you know, I think a lot of times people can feel when learning content is generic and they can feel like, OK, this isn't useful and they'll click on to the next thing. So I think that's another thing, um, Powtoon and tools that are, are like this that really enable design to happen quickly, you can address different aspects of content to different personas um, in your audience much better than 
again, those video production days where now, you know, you're really forced to create something generic because of the time investment, um, the lack of efficiency in that. The other thing that's been so great about tools today is you can evolve quickly. Um, because a lot of the things we used to create, they used to be very time intensive to create. It was very static. It, it almost like reinforces the one and doneness. It's like, oh man, that last training program, it took six months to upgrade that. So we're not going to touch that again for five years. Well, guess what? Your business is probably moving way faster than that. So but again, those are the kinds of things we can do is now we can be much more adaptive, we can be much more iterative. And I just think these are all of the things we need. Um, and we need to be able to sunset things. <laughs> mm. Otherwise, your libraries just get super cluttered. So it's like, hey, that evolution you made, if, I don't know, the OG, the original doesn't matter anymore, then get rid of it. And let's, you know, stay focused on this new iteration we just put out there. Um, so there's just a little important point there. And this is one I don't see a lot of people doing yet. Yeah, we have massive amounts of data storage available. Doesn't mean it necessarily helps us make things accessible when we're using that data storage as max. It's okay to delete something at some point. Um, so yeah, just, yeah, I guess it's like new year, kind of Marie Kondo, your element. Right. Yes, <laughs> only, only learning that sparks joy. <laughs> uh, no, I love it. And I think also your point about personas is so important, right? Because I think, and this is something I know certainly from the marketing world, right? This is, this is language marketers have been using for a long time, but I also know it from my music performance and, and composition days. Know your audience, right? Uh, this is an, an important part of putting together content you have to think through who's receiving this what's their context and how will they be reacting to it and it it really kind of helps you do the algebra of finding that language i know who this person is i know what drives them and i know what i want to communicate to them what what's the language that's going to connect with them or what are the visuals that are going to connect with them can we personalize this video like you mentioned right the big production every change adds on to that production. Whereas if you have uh, an authoring tool or a creative tool that allows you to simply, you know, copy, edit, make an iteration and, and test and get feedback and say, you know, boy, it's right at four minutes here where we just lose everyone. Let's make a version that skips from slide four to six right away. Or, you know, however that process plays out, it's so much more active uh, and, and that makes, sense right it's the idea that you sort of create something and it sits there forever it just feels so outmoded because it's not it's not how we're it's not the newspaper doesn't get printed once a day you know uh our our communications aren't aren't collected once a day at the mailbox i mean there's a, a constant stream and and likewise the way we uh we iterate on and improve the video content we create, the learning content we create, the uh, architecture of how all these pieces come together, the way we improve and iterate on that uh, needs to be the same, needs to be immediate in the stream of how we work. Yeah, 100%. And that's, you know, again, that's all really hard to do when you think your goal as a learning designer is to create that one training program or, or one course or class. It, all of this kind of possibility really comes to the forefront when you've shifted your goal to surrounding your learners with more than one learning asset for a learning goal. Once you make that shift, then you're like, okay, how do I create the best pieces for a particular goal? If I'm working on you know, a, a diversity and inclusion goal, or if I'm working on uh, data security, cybersecurity as my goal, as my training topic, hey, I know I don't need to cram everything into that one class or course. So, because now my goal is to create this learning cluster. So what are gonna be the social pieces I'm gonna bring in? What are gonna be the immediate pieces I bring in? How am I gonna get those across to my learner personas? How are those gonna be matched up to my learner personas? Um, those are all the questions you can start asking the moment you move from, I'm cramming everything into this one program or this one training topic. So everything you're talking about with personas and videos and creating that and tools, you have to shift your goal um, from that deliverable to really open up this whole other field of possibilities. Yeah, it's not just about filling the calendar with training, 
you know, uh, it's yeah, easy exactly. to, that's easy to do. It's easy to just set a date and invite people and hope they show up and, you know, we're done. But uh, to really create something that catches people where they, where they need that and is a mix of, here's my friend who's good at this versus I need to sit and really get this information. You know, all of those moments and attitudes play into how we're learning as well. So I, I really, I think that's spot on. Um, one question to kind of bring us toward the end of this conversation and also start engaging with some of the questions and a reminder to everyone in the audience, please do throw your questions in the Q&A section. We're almost there. If you see one that you also want to know the answer to, give it a thumbs up and that'll help us prioritize the questions when we get there. Um, but last question for you, Crystal. What, you don't have a crystal ball, maybe you do. Your name is Crystal, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> what learning trends are coming our way in 2022 and beyond? What do you see on the horizon? Yeah, I think the, the investment in L&D is gonna continue to grow, especially as executives see L&D uh, delivering results on some of these things we've been talking about today. As they see L&D becoming more agile, becoming more what learners are asking for, um, not becoming the, I think where we've been, unfortunately, despite all of our hard work, a lot of it has been, well, oh, I, I have to go to that training and, you know, I have to schedule that and wait for that. Um, so in the meantime, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. So the more we move away from that while still delivering on our live classes, I think we're going to see that investment continue. And I think the other thing I'm really thinking about, as I imagine 2022 and beyond, um, a lot of the tech platforms I've seen are really moving towards social learning, which I think is, is a fabulous, fabulous shift. Um, I think it's much needed. And um, what that does is it starts to remove the burden from L&D always being the creator and owner of content. So I think that's a really big shift is watching learners start to create content. And more than that, what I'm so hoping to see is what I'm calling collective wisdom platforms emerge. So now we have, as I was mentioning earlier, like this big kind of chaos of content. And I'm really looking for platforms that are doing a really good job of creating collective wisdom from that, helping people filter through that content um, or also integrate and build on one another's content. So that way, you know, when we think about these organizations at scale, we're really seeing um, things we couldn't even do before, right? Without digital technology, it was really hard to capitalize on the collective scale of an organization's wisdom. Well, this is what today's technology can do. And I'm waiting to see the learning platforms that are gonna get us there. You know what I'm talking about, Nick? Like, you know, I want to know, like, that person in Japan building on this person in Israel, building on this person in the U.S., and it all comes together, and I get to watch that, and I'm like, man, that changed me, that I had that aha moment, because people all around the globe, I got to see their wisdom, and it all made sense. It was relevant for me. Amazing, and that's a vision I think we can all get behind, you know? I think more and more we're seeing there's no one person, institution, uh, department, whatever, that has every answer uh, and that we should be inviting everyone into this conversation. Hey, speaking of inviting everyone into this conversation, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's time for your questions. Uh, so I'm very excited. We got three that made it into the Q&A section. Uh, I'm sure that there are also a few others here in the, in the, in the chat section. So if, uh, if I don't get to yours, it's because it's in the chat section. Put it in Q&A and then I'll be able to see it. Wonderful. Linda, Linda Sullivan is asking us, are learning objectives developed for the cluster of tools? I'm not sure, Linda, exactly what that means. But in other words, are, are learning, uh, in a, does the tool you're using have an impact on the learning objectives that you need to implement or that you're shooting for? Uh, I, let me know if that was uh, close to what you were asking, Linda, if you're still on the call. Go ahead and let us know. What do you, what do you think? And, and Linda, I got you. I, I, you know, I think I'm glad you're asking this because, you know, what, what is a learning design without a goal, <laughs> right? Without a target. And um, so 100%, whenever you design a learning cluster, 
learning objectives are actually, it's a huge part of it. Um, one of our five actions of the model is the change on the job behavior action. And that's because when we set goals for our learning cluster, we're really focused on defining what is the actual change, not in the classroom, not at the end of watching this video, not at the end of this e-learning, but on the job we want to see happen. Um, and so we actually set our goals for out there, and then we work our way back to what is the objective for each asset that makes up the cluster or, or each tool, as you put it. Um, so learning objectives, 100%, and I really would recommend anyone who's interested in this model to learn more about those five actions because they really, the objectives piece is huge. If you don't know what you're aiming for, you can't measure it either. Uh, you can't figure out what your decisions are going to be, how to make those decisions. You need those anchors in your objectives. So great question, Linda. Awesome. Very, very good. Tomas has a Powtoon question. Is there lip sync in Powtoon already based on an uploaded audio file? So Tomas, not yet. We don't have lip sync incorporated into the Powtoon platform yet, although I do believe it is on the roadmap. The good news is actually uh, you know, lip sync, um, uh, text to speech, other tools like that, uh, it, you know, A, we're, we want to find the right one, uh, because when that's not good, it's very bad. <laughs> you know, if you've got, uh, you know, a very robotic voice, if you've got lip sync that, that isn't dependable, it can actually get us uh, totally take away from the power of the video. So until then, actually, our characters uh, in, in their various animation poses, uh, they move their mouths in ways that could definitely fit. And uh, I recommend if you're interested in more about that, take a look uh, either at our tutorials page, powtoon.com slash tutorials. Also our YouTube channel, I do uh, how-to videos every Tuesday on our YouTube channel. So lots and lots of helpful things for video making skills there. Uh, I, I, know, I know that uh, uh, lip sync can be really tempting, but again, uh, unless it's unless it's the right tool, we're still looking to and developing exactly uh, the functionality that's going to work well for that. You're definitely better off working without a bad tool. Um, so, uh, but we'll keep you posted. And thank you, Tomas. I'll definitely pass along to our product team that there's more interest in lip sync. Um, Carla has a great question here. Uh, how do you know if a student or user achieves competence? in a learning clustered model. In other words, you know, we've got a, a course and someone clicks through all the course, I know that they've at least clicked it. How, how are you measuring success with the learning cluster design model? Yeah, so another one of our actions, another great question, because another one of our actions is the track transformation action. So, you know, this is such a key question because in the past, it, we were measuring how many people attended that class or how many people have um, used our e-learning or watched our videos um, or downloaded a tool. Sure, we can continue to measure all of those things. And again, if you've set your objectives, you know what you're shooting for in terms of that on the job chain. And so we're really looking to measure business impact at the end of the day with our track transformation action. And this is one where we're actually doing a lot of research right now, because as you can imagine, um, it's different when you're uh, measuring one, the performance of one learning asset or one course or class versus the collection. And this is another place where data can really help us and becoming better at data and analysis as L&D professionals is a huge growth area. Um, and so actually Lisa M.D. Owens, my co-author and colleague right now, she's in conversations uh, with the top folks in measurement in the learning industry, David Vance, Jack Phillips, um, and really bringing together all those minds and collective wisdom to making sure our track transformation action really helps us judge the impact of that collection of learning assets on our end business result. Um, and of course, for each individual asset, you can still track has a student achieved competence, you know, for that particular piece. And then really going back and seeing, did it make a difference back on the job? Um, and if you're interested in measurement, we actually are doing a joint webinar. <laughs> Just We happen to be doing a joint webinar in February um, with Jack Phillips about that topic. So if you're interested in that, I know Nick is going to point out our website at the end, but learningclusterdesign.com, you can learn more about our events there. 
Amazing. Awesome. Tomas has another question. Tomas says, uh, let's see. I thought that one of the trends right now is the is the cohort courses. Can you tell can you tell us how Powtoon animations can increase learning goals in cohort courses? I'm not entirely sure, Tomas, what you mean exactly by cohort courses, but if Crystal does, maybe you've got an insight into maybe this. My guess, and you know, you tell me about the Powtoon animation part, of course, but cohort courses, a lot of folks are putting folks in a cohort together going through a course or, you know, blended learning programs where maybe they're doing pre-work, they're attending a few pieces, and then they're doing, you know, some social learning and then some video watching, and they'll do that all together as a group with the same people. Um, mm. So yeah, what what do you think about that? With well, that? I, I could definitely say, first of all, if you know that, that you're, it's part of knowing your audience, right? So this, the folks engaging uh, with this content will be engaging with it collectively as a group over time, right? So you have the opportunity then to build in little Easter eggs or moments of connection for them. One thing that's great is our character builder. And you saw that earlier, actually, I made characters of myself and, and of Crystal, but uh, you can create a character that looks just like someone on the team or just like someone from your organization, or you can tweak your characters to connect more uh, accurately with your audience. If you wanna emphasize diversity and inclusion, you can do that with uh, people in all shapes and sizes uh, uh, to, to do that as well. So that's, that's one component of it. And the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, animation, video, uh, there, we process these visual ideas much faster than we process language. We've, we've put language on top of our senses, uh, but, but our senses are actually reacting to things much at a much faster rate. And so uh, what I would say is the power of video in every context continues to be the power of video here in a cohort class where um, you and the rest of the folks in your cohort are going to be connecting more uh, deeply, uh, it will be able to untangle complicated concepts when they're presented visually. Uh, and all of those advantages for video in general also apply here. Um, Sadiq has a question for Sadiq, welcome. Powtoon really helps us in learning already. However, I think it would be great if we can prepare SCORM-based related learning content through this. Now I know SCORM, that's, a, that's a, like an LMS standard, like a content standard. Just briefly for the folks who don't know, Crystal, if you wanted to tell us a little bit about what SCORM compliance is all about, uh, if you have that off the top of your head. Um, but if not, I'll, I will also mention, uh, I, I, my limited understanding of this is that uh, MP4 video files uh, can be worked into whichever LMS platform you're working with, and the SCORM compliance should carry their exporting an MP4 is available. That's a great response, Nick. <laughs> oh, wonderful. So that's my response and, and there we go. Uh, so Sadiq, I hope that that answers that for you. A few more here. Kath has a question for us. Kath wants to know, what do you think is the most effective way of conducting trainings for almost 10,000 employees, right? Here's a scale issue. Uh, is it through virtual presentations? If so, how can we check the effectiveness of it? What do you think? Yeah. So Here's where I think it's it, we start to move away from our old goals of, you know, let's try to create the one generic, one size fits all, one and done type of approach. Um, so I can't say off the top of my head, is a virtual presentation going to be effective or not for 10,000 employees, right? What I would say is we have to know who those 10,000 employees are, right? What are their roles? What is the topic you're trying to train them on? What are, the, what are you really trying to create in terms of the change for them? And based on that, can you, rather than having a one-size-fits-all approach, come up with a cluster of ways for those 10,000 employees? Where, when, how are they most likely going to want and need to learn? So just, you know, to give you an example, if we take one of the most basic topics we've been training on since the beginning of time, time management, okay? We're all about time management. We've always been trying to figure out how do we have more effective meetings? How do we manage our time more effectively? Well, you could put everyone through, a, your 10,000 folks through a virtual presentation on time management. And two months later, they're gonna have forgotten that virtual presentation. They're gonna have their own time management challenge come up 
You know, maybe they got triple booked and it's a personal holiday for them and they don't know what to do. So, you know, how did that virtual presentation really have an impact? Now, if you knew because you did your design research that, wow, in our 10,000 employees, about 20 to 30 percent of them, for the most part, are often triple booked. And that's a really common problem. You would gear your training, your presentation towards that topic, but then afterwards, you'd have other assets in place for them. You might have a Powtoon telling them how to deal with triple bookings and how to say no to people, uh, how to say no to your two most unfavorite <laughs> um, scheduled meetings, right? So you can guess that that would be more effective than that one size fits all, one and done type of approach. So there is no way to really say that this particular tool is going to be the one you should go to for every single training challenge you come across. That's our old way of thinking. Our new way of thinking really is get to know your people, get to know the challenge they're really facing, when, where, and how they're facing it. And do you have a learning asset in place for that moment of learning need? Um, and that's, you know, that's really how you're going to know things are effective. Uh, you'll hear back. Hey, my triple bookings, they've gone down. I've been able to manage that, but I feel more confident doing that. Anything you'd add to that, Nick? Or, if, you know, have you seen ways that are effective for at scale for that many folks? Well, I mean, I definitely think I echo what, what you say, Crystal, that it, it depends on context. I would say, you know, is it through virtual presentation? Well, part of it. Uh, but what else is it through? Uh, and I think that that it can be, um, I, I definitely just echo what you say. I think you need to know your audience and you need to think, um, what's the purpose of that virtual presentation? And is there, are there additional uh, su related supported ways to reinforce those, the things you want them to walk away with? Is it, uh, you know, it may be really important to have uh, you know, a virtual presentation that all 10,000 people are, are invited for to set some context, but maybe there's follow-up for specific departments in a particular way or other folks who showed engagement, didn't show engagement, other ways um, to sort of supplement what you're doing to make sure that there are multiple avenues to find that information uh, and that folks are going to connect with it uh, in the way that makes sense for them. So that's, that's my take uh, as well. I think it echoes very much what what Crystal had to say. Um, do you just want to mention, uh, and there's a couple of questions here for, so uh, Michael Anthony wants to know, interested in learning how to achieve measurable results based on assets such as a Powtoon video. So there's, uh, we've come at that a couple of times here about how do you measure success? And another question that uh, related here, uh, are there ways that we can bring interactivity to Powtoon? trainings or is the learning cluster model moving away from interactivity? So stepping back, I, to me, this is asking kind of a question about how we're presenting the, con the learning content, right? Is it, how do we measure the effectiveness of a video? Is that part of our LMS platform? Is it the engagement with a course? Is it about its performance on a social channel. Uh, so i let you get to that in just one moment. And then also that question of interactivity, because I know a lot of uh, folks, for instance, they might be using Articulate or something like that, where they're creating, uh, you know, interactive moments with chunks of video or other folks who might be gamifying um, uh, a course or something like that, that would include sort of a choose your own adventure and, you're, and you've got different pieces of video for different components of that. All of this together, how are we measuring success of a piece of content? Uh, and what's the role of interactivity today? Yeah, again, like, I think when it comes to the measurable results piece, you really, you really have to determine that as a designer with your leadership on what, what is a result you'd like to see and that you wanna measure. So yeah, you could measure views, but are views meaningful to your leadership? Does that tell you, you know, did you achieve success with that? If yes, then great, measure views. If you're looking for something like likes or shares or um, you know, even qualitative feedback, a lot of times people below a video will ask that question um, and you know, even just was this video useful for you or things like that. That might be a way that you go to measure the effectiveness of a Paltine video. So that's gonna be really up to you 
that's and that's to be honest that's like a lot of what i'm going to say about interactivity as well is you know the learning cluster design model is really about you being the strategist and if you're trying to give the strategic thinking away uh, you know in your job you got to you got to take a second look at that because you're, we're not talking about moving away from interactivity. If interactivity is what you need to make that change happen for your learner based on what you know about your learner. Bring your interactivity in. Bring all of that in. But if you know they're watching those videos and it's a bite-sized thing for them, they're watching it um, you know, in the airport when they're sitting waiting around and that's not the moment for interactivity, don't put it in. So it's up to you to make those choices. And that's kind of why the, the model really helps you think through that framework and, and, and really guides you in making those choices. Um, because at the end of the day, technology is a tool. It is up to you to figure out how to use it based on the context. As, you know, as Nick has been saying as well, it's very context-based. Um, so if you end up using your technology just one way, you're probably missing out on a lot of the other ways that technology could be used. And I'm sure, you know, Nick, you have some thoughts on how Powtoon, the many ways Powtoon videos have been measured or have been used in an interactive way. Um, but they're, they're all choices you make as a designer versus a choice the tool makes for you. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, you know, um, so, it, you know, in the, in the marketing context, or if you're talking about the performance of a video, uh, you know, in, in, on social media or on, a, on a, you know, on YouTube or something like that, you're talking about things like view and view through rate, right? How, on average, how far through a video uh, folks get. Um, so th those, those can be very important, um, but, but sometimes they can be vanity metrics. There may be more than one way to achieve those metrics. And, uh, you know, are you just noting a number for the sake of having a number, uh, but it may not actually relate to whether you're achieving anything with this content. So uh, again, I'm echoing Crystal here, but to say that you need to understand what it, what success would look like and how to measure that. And then that's, that's what you need to measure, not necessarily the performance, however, that's defined of the video. Uh, so uh, I would, I would definitely recommend that sort of broader sense. Are you achieving your goals? That's the, that is the question that measurement needs to answer. Uh, so, uh, so I hope that that's clear there. And on interactivity, I would say, you know, interactivity sometimes because technologically, like say early 2000s, right? The, uh, people might've felt very stuck with one kind of content delivery and, and, and uh, in, you know, experience, which might have been boring. And interactivity was a way to maybe hack the attention a little bit and keep people engaged in something that wasn't engaging. So if interactivity makes sense, is a part of like the flow of the story that's being told and is going to be meaningful for the learner, I say, yes, keep it in. Like I mentioned earlier, gamification or other sort of like choose your own adventure branching uh, kinds of uh, courses and things like that, where you're using video components in, in different ways or video that is meant not to be judged by the success because of its views, but because it's there to help inspire the team or invite them to participate in initiatives that are going on. All of that supportive stuff uh, is there too. Is that interactive? I mean, they're not clicking on anything or, or participating in that video, but it's the invitation to participate in this larger process and community of learning at your organization. So that's my non-answer answer to that. I hope that that is helpful, Casey. I want to just be sensitive to everyone's time. We only have a couple of minutes left here in the hour. And I wanted to uh, just say thank you, first of all, to everyone who's asked questions. And I'm so sorry for the few that we didn't get to there. Um, but the good news is, uh, as Crystal mentioned, they've got a, a, a webinar coming up in February. Powtoon has a ton of webinars coming up. So you should be receiving inv inv invitations to those coming up. And if not, uh, I can tell you, first thing, learn more. Go to learningclusterdesign.com to learn more about LCD Group and uh, the Learning Cluster Design model uh, and about their upcoming webinars and all of that good stuff. Um, I want to encourage you to find Powtoon 
on social media. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're very active on LinkedIn. Awesome conversations happening there. And as I mentioned, I'm posting on YouTube frequently. So please do find us. Also, let us know what are you creating? Uh, how, how, are, how did this webinar help you think about your goals in 2022? Tag us in your post. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and also a reminder, watch your inbox via email. Tomorrow you will receive uh, a link to a, an on-demand video replay of today's conversation. Uh, you'll also receive our new guide, The Future of L&D, a Manager's 2022 Guide. In fact, uh, not only will you see that in your email tomorrow, but I've got a link for you right now, dropping it into the chat to everyone. Visit that link, bit.ly slash LD dash guide dash 2022. And that will take you to our uh, LD guide for managers using video and visual communication in 2022. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Crystal, for everything you do uh, and for uh, giving us a little bit of insight into how we can get better results from our learning in 2022. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, Nick. Thank you so much, everybody, and love to hear your goals moving away from classes and courses and into a lot more. Love it. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Great rest of your week.